Thank you for joining us online today. Our mission here at Destiny is to win souls, make disciples, and help you live out your destiny. We would love to connect with you, so be sure that you follow us on our Facebook page at Destiny GSO. And make sure that you subscribe so that you can share this message with someone. Now, get ready for an awesome word from our pastor, Pastor Lee Stokes. Turn open in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. Today we're talking about uh, more, being more like Jesus. Specifically, Jesus made a statement, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Amen? Uh, all right, turn over in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. Are y'all ready to learn? Are y'all ready to learn? All right, watch this. Paul writes, therefore, whether we are at home on earth or away from him, uh, 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 earth away from him, or away from home and with him, we are constantly ambitious and strive earnestly to be pleasing to him. Are you trying to please God? Come on, are you? Your life ought to be. That's what Paul says here. He says, why? For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay, his reward, according to what he's done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he has achieved, been busy with and given himself and his attention to accomplishing. Je uh, Paul is letting us to know by the Holy Spirit here that there's much more than what you're experiencing in life right now. There is an afterlife. There is an eternal life. And he wants us to get that perspective. Your job is going to end one way or another. Everybody's job is. Everybody's job is going to end one way or another. Number one, you get, we could take, be taken up in the rapture. Your marriage too. Your marriage is going to end. Are y'all with me? Your family is going to end as you know it now. It is. Everybody's is. Your career is going to end. So Jesus is trying to get us to see the right perspective that there's something after this. Say, it's just a test. Yeah, what you're living in is just a test for eternity. All right? Okay. And therefore, being conscious of fearing the Lord that with respect and reverence, we seek to win people over to persuade them but what sort of persons we are is plainly recognized and thoroughly understood by God. And I hope that it is plainly recognized and thoroughly understood also by your conscience, your inborn discernment. Paul, Paul says, God already knows who you are. You need to know who you really are. Amen. Uh, next, please go down to verse 14. For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us because we are of the opinion and conviction that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. Underline this passage in your, in your Bible, verse 15. If you've got your Bible open there, watch this. And he, Jesus, died for all so that all those who live might no longer live, uh, might, might live no longer to and for themselves but to and for him who died and was raised again for their sake. So Paul, again, putting things in perspective, he says, the life that you have now should be lived for him. How can he even ask that? He said, because he died for you. He died so you could have an eternal life. So he's, he's letting us know that this life is not all there is. You've got to look, get a perspective that sees beyond your temporal life. Consequently, verse 16, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. Not, no, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man... Yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he's a new creation, a new creature altogether. Old, the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. You've got it already. You're a brand new creature, right? Watch this. Here's the perspective now. This is the context for every born-again believer's life. This is the context. Every born-again believer, every scenario of your life fits in this context. Your career, your marriage, your children, your health, everything fits in this context. Watch this. But all things are from God 
who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, which means received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself. You've got favor now that you're born again. Say, I've got favor. Come on, anybody glad about that? Having the favor of God? Y'all realize that's the most valuable thing you've got. You've got God's favor in your business, favor in your family, favor in your health, favor in every single thing. God is smiling at you. Say, I've got God's favor. Yeah. (laughs) He said, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, that by word and deed we might aim. That's our focus, our aim, to bring others into harmony with him. That is the context of your life. You are individually and uniquely gifted, different than the person sitting next to you, because God needs you in a unique place that no one else can fit that position like you but you. So you don't, you're not just gifted in sales to just sell that product. You are Christ's personal representative there to sell that product. God isn't going to ask you about your sales when you get to, to heaven. He's going to ask you about what did you do with this assignment? Because that's the context with which we live. There's somebody that's depending on you to make it to heaven. You get it? Your life is very, very important. All right, let me read on. Uh, Did I read that one already? No. It was God, personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. The, The who? The world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. So God, through Jesus, already made provision for the whole world to be in favor with himself. What is our responsibility then? And committing to us the message of that reconciliation. God did the reconciliation through Jesus. He became sin so we, the world could be righteous. He became sick so the world could be healed. By his stripes we're healed. He became poor so the world could be rich. Placed back into favor with God. God already did it. Now he needs a PR team to tell the world that. Hence the great commission. Are y'all with me? He says, in committing to us, say me. Everybody, say me. Me. The message of reconciliation, of restoration to favor. Next. So we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal, as it were, through us. God now makes his appeal through believers. Are y'all with me? Uh, We as Christ's personal representative, you are heaven's personal representative. Hit the person next to you and say, you're God's representative. Watch this, Paul says, we as Christ's personal representatives beg you for his sake to lay, for his sake. What does that mean? So that he has a good reputation. God is a loving God, but the world doesn't know it because most believers don't know it. So for his sake, represent him well. Watch what he says. As Christ's person represents, beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor. Lay hold of the healing that's rightfully yours. Lay hold of the abundance that's rightfully yours. Why? So that you can represent the kingdom of heaven. Are you with me? God doesn't deliver you from alcoholism to stay away from alcoholics. He delivered you from alcoholism to help some other alcoholic. God doesn't deliver you from drug addiction to stay away from drug addicts. No. Now you have a ministry to drug addicts. Are y'all with me? Amen. Uh, Now offered you and be reconciled to God. Jump down to verse uh, chapter 6 verse 1 for me please. Or did I leave it there? I might have left it there. Let me look at my notes. I may have. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Now, turn over to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, Message Bible. Thank you, back in the back. Make some noise for him in the back. Okay, y'all a little bit weak on the making noise today, but I guess y'all got pen and paper, all that. Okay. Jesus on his Sermon on the Mount says, let me tell you why you're here. This breaks it down. I love getting to the bottom line of things. I love that. I love just getting, you know, all the, all the chit chatter. I'm like, okay, what's the bottom line here? Bottom line. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I could digress right there because I'm in the market for a car. You know, I, my car got totaled, so I, I'm, I'm dealing with car salesmen. And you know, come on, you know. <laughs> hold on, hold on, stop, stop, stop. Get to the bottom line. Can you take this or not? 
You can't take this. I'm, I don't want to waste your time or mine. If you can, you can. If you can, I know it's there. Can you do it? Well, that. Yes or no? My daddy taught me that. His little boy is going with him to the car dealers and watching. Just... Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Right? right? If you lose your saltiness, your flavor, your God flavor, right? How will people taste godliness? That lets me know that God is depending on us. That's why you're here. Hit the person next to you and say, that's why you're here. Uh huh. God pays very well. Just get on his payroll. Uh huh. God, give me that job. God, I need that job. Give me that new business. Are you going to represent me there? That don't mean you got to be all deep and weird. Come on, hit the person next to you. Say, don't be deep and weird. All right, we're going to get to that. Just stick with your pastor. How will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage if you lose this aspect of life. All right? Here's another way to put it, Jesus says. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. I love that. I love that. Do people on your job, do people at school know you're a believer? Do they know that they can come to you for prayer, for healing, for, for grace, for advice, for wisdom? Are you with me? God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? Next. I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. God said, I'm going to put you on shine. Do you get what he's saying here? I want to elevate you. I want to promote your life. Be my representative, though. Come on, somebody. Hit the person next to you and say, God really wants to promote you. Yeah, he wants to put you on shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt, other, uh, prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Did y'all see that? Say he's finished reviewing right now. Now, look over. No, I'm not. I got a couple other verses. <laughs> Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Ephesians 4 and verse 1, Paul writing here, I've told you, week after week, all the epistles are written this way. Uh, he'll start out with establishing who you are in Christ, what you have, what your benefits are. Then he tells you, because of this divine calling on your life, here's what God is asking of you. He gives, and then he says, but here's what I need back from you. All right? Paul says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, I therefore the prisoner for the Lord appeal to and beg you to walk, lead a life worthy of that divine calling of the ministry of reconciliation to which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons of God's service. He's saying walk like a soldier. Walk like one. Live a life that's representative of a representative of Christ. Hit the person next to you. Say, he's talking to you right there. Tell your second choice. The person you did tell that one, now tell them on the other side. All right. So I'm gonna go to chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him. Follow his example as well-beloved children imitate their father. So he's saying, we need to be like Christ. We're, we're his representatives. Let's be more like him. Hence the title of the series, uh, uh, More Like Jesus. Look at chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. All that Paul's epistles are like this. They're written like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, amplified version again. He says, pattern yourselves after me. Follow my example as I imitate and follow Christ, the Messiah. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm going to live a lifestyle before you that represents how this should be. You do it like I do it. Are, are y'all with me? That's what Paul's saying, and that's what we're talking about this series, becoming more like Jesus, being a representative for him. So we find out in all these passages that we're not just saved from sin, hell, darkness, sickness, poverty, lack. We're saved to service. Not just saved from hell, but saved to service. Are you with me? Not just saved from sin, but saved to service. So not only did God save us from hell, but he wants to use us to get some others out of hell. 
Not only did he save us from sickness and disease, he wants to use us to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Are y'all with me? You're the conduit for the blessing of God. Are y'all with me in this place? Say, I'm Christ's personal representative. Amen, amen. Now, Jesus always, remember last couple weeks ago, we talked about Jesus is always faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Scripture, scripture, scripture after scripture about God's faithfulness. Last week, last week we talked about his compassion for the lost. This week, I want to talk about how Jesus lived a life of not my will, but your will be done. We need to adapt that lifestyle. Now, let me explain it to you. Turn over to Luke chapter 22, or just look up on the screen. Verse 39 through 44, amplified version. Are you learning already? Now, y'all, this is such a blessing when we live this lifestyle. Amen? Watch this, so. Watch this. And he came out and went as was his habit. I love the amplified version. Jesus made a habit of doing this. To the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. Mm -hmm. and when he came to the place he said to them pray that you may not at all enter into temptation he said this is my habit every day I go over here to the Mount of Olives disciples follow me he tells them pray every day he made a habit of prayer that's what we'll talk about next week he says and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and did what and prayed that was his habit saying father if you are willing remove this cup from me yet not my will but always your will be done I love the amplified version because God Jesus is saying here I'd rather not have to die a death like this my flesh doesn't want to do it I'd rather not have to take on all the sin I'm holy tr three times holy 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 but yet if there's another way Lord father let that happen because this is going to be extremely painful let's see how painful it is and there appeared to him an angel from heaven he's really grieving over this right an angel from heaven strengthening him in spirit and being in an agony of mind have y'all been there before oh there's something i gotta do but i don't i don't want to do it but i need to do this he prayed all the more earnestly and intently and his sweat became like great clots of blood dropping down to the ground he's in real anguish here because he knows he needs to do something that is going to be extremely painful dying he knows that he's going to take on the sin sickness judgment of the entire world and he says lord if there's another way to do this let that be done but if it's not your will, if it, he says, but not my will, your will always be done. But I'm just saying, if there's another way, let that be done. But I know, God, your will be done. Are y'all with me? This is how agonizing this is. Say, not my will, but his did be done. Jesus always kept this attitude through everything he did. Look over at uh, John chapter 5 and verse 30, amplified version. John chapter 5 verse 30 he says I'm able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders even as I hear I judge I decide as I am bidden to decide as the voice comes to me so I give a decision and my judgment is right just righteous because I do not seek or consult my own will I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself my own aim my own purpose but only the will and pleasure of the father who sent me how much greater our lives and the world would be if we took that attitude not your Lord not my will in this marriage but your will be done because right now I'm mad and I don't want to do this I don't want you to I, 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 I but Lord what do you will right now Lord I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like I don't want to do nothing I ain't coming here I ain't doing it. but not what I want Lord what do you want are y'all listening to me all right, let's go on a little bit deeper. Go on over to chapter 6. 
chapter 6, John, chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven, verse 38, not to do my own will and purpose, but to do the will and purpose of him who sent me. 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose any of all that he has given me, but that I should give new life and raise them up at the last day. For this is my Father's will and his purpose that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. Do you see what he's saying? I've got to give my life so that everyone who sees this and cleaves to and trusts in and relies on him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up from the dead at the last day. Somebody thank God that Jesus did what the Father wanted and not he wanted what he wanted to do. His flesh. You get what I'm saying right there? It's his flesh. Because just like Ara Kelly says, my mind's telling me no, but my body, my body's telling me yes. We'll leave Ara Ar 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 Kelly out of this. Ara. Ara. Now, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 through 10. Hebrews chapter 5. Alex Moore, where's Alex? Right there, he said his kid. <laughs> Thanks, pastor, for introducing my children to Ara Kelly. Sorry, Alex, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Watch this. Je now, before Jesus came, before he came to the earth, the Bible opens up a window for us to see a conversation that Jesus had with the Father before he came. This is some of the most profound scripture in the Bible to me. Look at it. Here it is. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said to the Father, Jesus says to the Father, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. You didn't want all these lambs and bullocks. That wasn't your interest. You're not interested in these sacrifices that men make. He said, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure in that. Then I said, Jesus said, behold, I've come. In the volume of the book, it's written, this whole book's written about me. It's about me coming and sacrificing my life. To do what? your will oh god to do your will this is what you want you want me to go to the earth you prepared a body for me to sacrifice to do your will previously saying sacrifice and offering burn offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law then he said behold i have come to do your will say i've come to do his will say i'm alive to do his will Hit the person next to you and say, join in with me. I'm alive to do his will. Are y'all listening to me? Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. Watch what that will was. He takes away the first covenant that he may establish the second covenant. The first covenant was contingent on our doing. The second covenant was co is completely contingent on what Jesus would do. He said, I've got to go and do that. Are y'all with me in this place? by that will what by your will we have been sanctified i want y'all to see this when you submit your life to the will of god even though it may be painful initially even though it may be painful it's going to pay huge dividends in the long run come on somebody again you've got to get an eternal perspective for this you got to get an eternal perspective, and that's what believers should have. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. No more bulls and, and oxes and all that. Are y'all with me? Say, thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus had this perspective, but so did John the Baptist. John the Baptist understood this perspective that life is temporary, so we'll submit to the word of God. This dissertation happened in John the Baptist's uh, ministry. Some people came to him and said, hey... Jesus is baptizing more people than you. Hold up, he's... He, you know, and they were trying to throw some shade on him. They were trying to make him feel bad and belittle him. They were trying to make him feel... Oh, you ain't doing as much as uh, Jesus, you know. 
<laughs> they were trying to, trying to hurt his feelings. And look what he said. This is, how you, this is how you can cut that off real quick. Look what John the Baptist said in John. Yeah, he says, he says that's no problem. Because he must increase, but I must decrease. I get it. It's not about me, boo. It's about him and his program anyway. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to defer all my praise and gratification till he gives it to me when on the other side. So even if I have to give up my life for him, no problem, because it ain't over yet. Oh, y'all, y'all got quiet on that. That's a big, big step. Y'all, y'all with me? But that's the, that's the, that's what Christianity is genuinely about. It's not about you and I right here, right now. Oh, it's quiet in this Presbyterian Episcopalian church. Look over how, how Paul says it. Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one, verse 21. Chapter one, verse 21 through 27. Watch this. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. To be alive is Christ. His life in me. He said, now my life lived here on earth is Christ living in me. It's not about what I want. He says, so because of that, to die is gain. Because I don't get to just do anything I want in this life now. My life is for him here in this earth. So to die is actually better for me. You get it? To, and to die is gain. Y'all, get out of your mind that death for a believer is bad. It is not. Now, I'm not trying to get to heaven today. Come on, somebody. I wanted to see Jesus. Not today. Y'all follow what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? I ain't trying to. <laughs> but he wants us to get an eternal perspective. For me to live is Christ, his life in me, and to die is gain, the gain of the glory of eternity. Do y'all ever think about that? Think of the best. I was thinking about, I was reading this and studying this this week and just kind of meditating on it. And I was trying to see, Lord, how great can heaven be? Because to me, you know, I, I think vacation is just the bomb to me. Anybody like vacation? Well, Shanae have, and I had the pleasure to get married in Jamaica, Negril, Jamaica, at a resort called Sandals, all inclusive resort, I might add. If destiny or the message that you've just heard has impacted your life in any way and you would like to partner with us financially, you can go to our website, www.leestokes.org, and click on the Donate Now button. We hope you've enjoyed the message. Thank you for watching.